Secretary. Thank you very much. I can ask you. Your Excellencies, a very good morning. I'm pleased to see you all here, and I'm delighted to open the 21st ISS Shangri-La Dialogue, Asia's premier defense summit. I would like to begin by thanking Prime Minister Lawrence Wong for having hosted us last night uh, for the opening keynote address. Uh, in the keynote address, President Marcos of the Philippines spoke about his vision for a strong and prosperous Asia-Pacific, and he made important points about the integrity of multilateralism and the rule of law. It's fantastic to see so many delegations here at the dialogue. It is fantastic to see so many ministers engaging in defense diplomacy. And in a minute, we will begin the first plenary session uh, here at the dialogue uh, on the United States strategic partnerships in the Indo-Pacific. A brief reminder that all the speeches or the answers, but also all the questions uh, delivered in these uh, plenary sessions will be on the record. We are techno techno technologically enabled here at the uh, uh, ISS, so if you wish to take the floor to ask a question or make a comment, you will have noticed you have a microphone at your seat to, uh, to do so. You will need your delegate badge, this little badge here, to activate the microphone uh, all together. There are two steps involved. I hope that's, that should be manageable. The first one is to put your delegate badge uh, into the microphone unit, um, which will uh, activate the unit, and then uh, once you seek the floor, you press uh, the speak uh, button. Then your microphone, once you've done that, your microphone will turn green, and your name is added uh, to my list that I have up here. When your microphone is green, it is not a hot mic. When I select you from the list that I have here, your micro microphone will turn red. And when it does so, it is very much a hot mic. And then you have an opportunity to ask your questions. As always, I'd like to encourage you to keep those questions short and crisp so that we can get to uh, uh, meaningful, insightful answers quickly and get, to many, get through many of them, as many of them as we, as we can. There will be points when uh, more people will be seeking the floor than I can uh, uh, get in in the available time, and I'm sure you will all understand that I will need to uh, be a bit selective uh, so that we get a variety of perspectives in. So two steps, insert your badge, press the button, you're in the queue. And I'm delighted to now turn to Lloyd Austin, who is back at the uh, ISS Shangri-La Dialogue. Uh, many of you gathered here will know that Secretary of Defense Austin has traveled frequently uh, to this region in the pursuit of U.S. strategic partnerships and in the pursuit of U.S. strategic priorities. Mr. Secretary, we're honored to have you back uh, at the Shangri-La Dialogue, and this podium is yours. We are we're looking forward to your remarks, Mr. Secretary. Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be back in Singapore. And I'm glad to see everyone for my third Shangri-La Dialogue as Secretary of Defense. So this is starting to be a habit. And Bastian and John uh, told me that if I came back again this year, I'd get a free set of steak knives. So. So let me again thank IISS and our hosts for bringing us together here. This is my fourth visit to Singapore as Secretary of Defense, and I've spoken at a IISS event every time. And there really is nothing like the Shangri-La Dialogue. I'm glad that we've got a distinguished bipartisan delegation here this year from the United States Congress. Let me thank Singapore for being such an outstanding host year after year. I'm especially grateful to Senior Minister Teo 
and to my good friend, Minister Ong. Let me congratulate Prime Minister Wong on his new role. And you know, it's great to see so many friends and valued colleagues in Singapore, such as Deputy Prime Minister Marles and President-elect Prabowo. We've also got some great partners who are here for the first time as Ministers of Defense, including Minister Kihara, Minister Shen, Minister Collins, Minister Teodoro, Secretary Teodoro, and more. Let me also note that yesterday I had the opportunity to meet in person for the first time with Minister Dong of the People's Republic of China. We had a frank discussion, and that's important. When we all gathered here last year, I said that the right time for defense leaders to talk is any time and every time. So there is no substitute for direct military to military talks between senior leaders. And there's no substitute for open lines of communication to avoid misunderstanding and miscalculations. As I've always said, dialogue is not a reward. It's a necessity. And so I look forward to more talks with the PRC. Now, I know that you've seen a lot of me in this region. This is my 10th visit to the Indo-Pacific as Secretary of Defense. And I've attended every ADMM Plus gathering on my watch. And that's because the United States is a Pacific nation. And it's because this region, more than any other, is shaping the course of this century. The United States is deeply committed to the Indo-Pacific. We the United States is deeply committed to the Indo-Pacific. We are all in. And we're not going anywhere. As President Biden has said, for decades, America's enduring commitment to the region has been a springboard that's enabled transformative growth, ensured the open flow of commerce, and lifted millions of people out of poverty. And in today's world, the President noted, that relationship goes both ways. The United States remains vital to the future of the region. And the region is more vital than ever to the United States of America. You know, I made my first trip to Singapore as Secretary of Defense in July of 2021 in the first months of the, of the Biden administration. And Singapore and the region were still in the midst of the COVID pandemic. The whole audience was wearing masks. And leaders in this region were focused on how to source more vaccines and to climb out of the pandemic and open back up. But the region's recovery since then has been nothing short of inspiring. And that's a reminder of how much we can achieve together and how our deep ties can let us come together during tough times. It's a reminder of how the investments that we make today can pay dividends later, and often in new and unexpected forms of cooperation. So, I'd like to summon that spirit again today. We all understand the threats and challenges of today's global security landscape. And they range from the mounting damage of climate change to the specter of pandemic disease, from nuclear dangers to terrorism and turmoil in the Middle East from Russia's reckless war on Ukraine to actions in this region
that erode the status quo and threaten peace and stability. So we've gathered at a hinge in history. But over the past few years in this region, we've risen to meet this moment together. You know, in my first speech in Singapore as Secretary of Defense, I said that our countries share the shores of the Pacific. But we also share an understanding of the power of partnership. We understand that power because we've lived it. The United States and this region are more secure and more prosperous when we work together. And over the past three years, we've seen just what that looks like. Like-minded countries Our achievements together over the past three years reveal something even more fundamental about this region's future. Today we are witnessing a new convergence around nearly all aspects of security in the Indo-Pacific. This new convergence is producing a stronger, more resilient, and more capable network of partnerships. And that is defining a new era of security in the Indo-Pacific. You know, in the past, our experts would talk about a hub and spokes model for Indo-Pacific security. And today we're seeing something quite different. This new convergence is not a single alliance or coalition, but instead something unique to the Indo-Pacific. A set of overlapping and complementary initiatives and institutions propelled by a shared vision and a shared sense of mutual obligation. This new convergence is about coming together and not splitting apart. It isn't about imposing one country's will. It's about summoning our sense of common purpose. It isn't about bullying or coercion. It's about the free choices of sovereign states. And it's about nations of goodwill uniting around the interests that we share and the values that we cherish. Now, at the heart of this shared vision is a set of common principles. Countries across the Indo-Pacific, including the United States, are converging around these enduring beliefs. Respect for sovereignty and international law the free flow of commerce and ideas, freedom of the seas and skies, and openness, transparency, and accountability, equal dignity for every person, and the peaceful resolution of disputes through dialogue and not coercion or conflict, and certainly not through so-called punishment. These principles are widely shared. They are vital. And we've all seen the consequences when states choose to violate them. In February of 2022, Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine shocked the world and this region. And since then, Putin's war of aggression has provided us all with a preview of a world that none of us would want. It's a glimpse of a world where tyrants trample sovereign borders. A world where peaceful states live in fear of their neighbors 
in the world where chaos and conquest, conquest replace rules and rights. But Russia's lawless invasion also reminds us that free countries can rally together to help the victims of aggression. You know, we've all been inspired by the courage of Ukraine's troops and the resilience of Ukraine's people. Governments and people around the world have rushed to help Ukraine defend itself, including countries across the Indo-Pacific. And the United States will continue to stand strong for a free and secure Ukraine and for an open world of rules, rights, and responsibilities. As Prime Minister Kishida said at the White House just a few weeks ago, we must resolutely defend and further solidify a free and open international order based on the rules of law. And those principles remain vital right here in the Indo-Pacific. You know, President Marcos spoke eloquently last night about the rule of law in the South China Sea. And he's right. Every country, large or small, has the right to enjoy its own maritime resources and to freely sail and operate wherever international law allows. The harassment that the Philippines has faced is dangerous, pure and simple. And we all share an interest in ensuring that the South China Sea remains open and free. Peace and stability across this region are crucial for the whole world. Our friends in NATO and the European Union and the G7 know it, and so do we. So from day one, the Biden administration has emphasize that the Indo-Pacific is at the heart of U.S. strategy. Of course, we're not operating in a vacuum. Putin's imperial aggression against Ukraine has echoed around the world. So the crisis in the Middle East, or so has a crisis in the Middle East, after the vile October 7th Hamas terrorist assault on Israel. and the heartbreaking loss of Palestinian civilian life in Gaza since then. But despite these historic clashes in Europe and the Middle East, the Indo-Pacific has remained our priority theater of operations. Because just as what happens in Europe and the Middle East matters to this region, the actions that we take together here will continue shaping the 21st century for the entire world. And safeguarding the security and prosperity of this region remains the core organizing principle of U.S. national security policy. So let me be clear. The United States can be secure only if Asia is secure. And that's why the United States has long maintained our presence in this region. And that's why we continue to make investments necessary to meet our commitments to our allies and partners. Of course, this starts at home. The United States military remains the most capable fighting force on Earth. With the support of Congress, this administration has delivered major funding every year to keep it that way. And we've consistently linked our investments to our strategy. And I am proud that over the past three years, the United States has devoted historic amounts of resources towards maintaining peace, stability, and deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. Over the past three years, we've worked together with
with our friends to make this region more stable, more secure, and more prosperous. So today, I want to talk not just about the principles that we share, but also about the results that we've delivered. The Department's National Defense Strategy calls U.S. alliances and partnerships our greatest global strategic advantage. And today, that's truer than ever. So together with our friends in the region, we're breaking down national barriers and better integrating our defense industries. With Japan, we're developing a glide phase interceptor to counter hypersonic threats. With India, we've made historic progress on co-producing fighter jet engines and armored vehicles. Across Southeast Asia, we're using new technology and training to uphold freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. And that includes working closely with our allies in the Philippines to field maritime defensive capabilities and expanding maritime domain awareness across the region. In this spring, President Biden secured unprecedented funding for foreign military financing in the Indo-Pacific. We're moving quickly to get those funds to our partners. The recently passed National Security Supplemental also included major investments in our submarine industrial base to help strengthen our AUKUS partnership with Australia and the United Kingdom. We're also working together to fortify the shared capacity of the defense industrial bases of our allies and partners. And that's why so many countries, including the United States, are endorsing a statement of principles today to strengthen the resilience of the region's defense industrial bases. And so we are operating with our allies and partners like never before. And that part of the new convergence means more interoperability, more advanced capabilities, and more security. With Japan and the Republic of Korea, we have created a multi-year trilateral exercise plan. Its highlight is a new named exercise that will allow our countries to train together in unprecedented ways. With the Philippines, Australia, France, and more than a dozen observer countries, we just concluded the biggest Balakatan exercise yet. We're also making huge strides in two other major multinational exercises. Super Garuda Shield in Indonesia and Cobra Go in Thailand. Both now have higher participation levels than before the pandemic. And they're both getting larger and more complex. We've also secured a series of historic agreements with our allies and partners to transform our force posture throughout the Indo-Pacific. With Japan, we're forward stationing the most advanced formation in the United States Marine Corps. With the Philippines, we're expanding U.S. rotational access to four new sites through our Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. With Papua New Guinea, we finalized an historic defense cooperation agreement last year. And with Australia, we're moving out on major posture initiatives in every domain. And so these agreements are historic. And they're just the starting point. We are on the verge of even more powerful changes to our posture and presence in the Indo-Pacific. These changes 
rest on new and future arrangements among our Indo-Pacific allies and partners, as well as with our European partners. And you can see this growing trend in the new reciprocal access arrangement between Japan and Australia. And it's creating unprecedented opportunities. As these efforts mature, they will mean more seamless combined operations throughout the region. And the new convergence of overlapping and mutually reinforcing security institutions will amplify these activities. With Tokyo and Seoul, we'll share, we're sharing early warning uh, data on North Korean missiles in real time. We're advancing our partnership with Australia and Japan on an, on an integrated air and missile defense architecture. With the Quad, we're helping our partners sharpen their operational picture of their exclusive economic zones through the Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness. We're also investing with ASEAN in training and educational opportunities for the future defense leaders of Southeast Asia. So together, this new convergence has helped us make historic progress in the past three years. And we've strengthened stability on the Korean Peninsula. We've supported the status quo across the Taiwan Strait. And we stood up for the rule of law in the South China Sea. Now, sustaining this progress will take teamwork. It will take resolve, and it will But the Indo-Pacific's new convergence points to a better future for all of our countries. That means a future of fresh and growing partnerships. A future where long-standing friendships grow into even deeper forms of cooperation. A future where every country can defend itself. And a future where like-minded countries are more connected than ever. Now that's the future that all of our people deserve. And together, we're making it real. Together, we're investing in the capabilities that promote lasting security and stability. And together, we're ensuring that the Indo-Pacific will remain open and free. And so I am more determined than ever to build on these historic results of the past three years. I am more proud than ever of what we have achieved together. And I am more optimistic than ever about what, about what lies ahead. Thank you very much. Secretary Austin, thank you very much for those, for those remarks. I think uh, you made a very interesting point about the evolution from a hub and spokes model to um, uh, the convergence of overlapping initiatives that you, that you explained uh, in your remarks, the common purpose that you see around shared interest and, and, and values. You gave us important examples of progress that has been made around exercises, around military to military contacts, defense industrial resilience you mentioned, posture changes you mentioned. And you spoke uh, at the end there about fresh and growing partnerships um, uh, for that common purpose. So all those are points to uh, pick up on. Uh, we will now have a few questions. We'll take a few individual questions and we might start grouping a few uh, of them together. Uh, the list is getting uh, longer by the second. Uh, uh, the first uh, person I'd like to... So it's a good time to stop then. <laughs> 
We've got a, we've got a bit of time. Um, so the first one I'd like to I'd like to ask uh, is uh, uh, Trisha Ray from India and from the uh, Young Leaders Program. Trisha, your microphone is live. Thank you, uh, Trisha Ray from the Atlantic Council. Secretary Austin, my question for you is, uh, is there enough momentum in the U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy and the network of complementary and overlapping institutions, as you mentioned, to ensure continuity irrespective of the results of the U.S. election? Uh, I think there is significant uh, momentum. I think... Uh, a good example is the relationship that we enjoy with India right now is as good as or better than our relationship has ever been. It's really strong. You know, several years ago, we set out uh, with a uh, notion to gain approval for India to build uh, jet engines for fighter aircraft in India. I, I served on, a, on the board of a, a company that makes fighter, uh, makes uh, air, uh, jet engines for fighter aircraft, and I know how difficult this was going to be. And we were hopeful but very skeptical that we could get this across the finish line. We did it. That's happening. As I said in my speech, we're co-producing armored vehicles uh, with uh, with India. So. They're, the anchors of our progress are sunk pretty deep throughout the region. And they're based on common, a common vision and common values. And so I believe that the momentum that we see is going to not only continue, but it's going to, that flywheel is going to pick up speed. Because this benefits us all. But to answer your question, yes, I do think that uh, uh, it, uh, you know, th this will be lasting. You didn't ask me about who I thought would win the election, but I, I'll be willing <laughs> to share that with you. So. Thank you very much, yeah. Secretary. Uh, the next question uh, from South Korea, Chung Min Lee. Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you for your wonderful speech. The U.S. has always said that the ROK is a linchpin of Asian policy and security in the region. And yet, unlike AUKUS, the U.S. has been quite lukewarm to South Korea's desire to have nuclear-powered submarines. So my question to you, sir, is if the South Korean government officially asks Washington for its support in building nuclear-powered submarines for the ROK Navy, would you support such an initiative? Thank you. Well, I, I would tell you that, uh, and I see uh, Deputy Prime Minister Maul sitting right in front of you there, but uh, the initiative that uh, we've taken on with uh, Australia and the UK uh, is, uh, is one that will provide stability and security, assist in providing stability and security for the region for decades to come. This is a generational investment. This is no small endeavor. It is very, very difficult to go through each piece of this. Uh, and so uh, we are, uh, we've just started down this path with Australia. Uh, highly doubtful that uh, we, could, we could take on another initiative of this type uh, uh, any time in the near future. Uh, but I would also point out, and you mentioned this earlier, what a strong ally uh, the ROK is for us. Uh, and the fact that, uh, that, you know, we have depended on each other and will continue to depend on each other uh, for the foreseeable future. And we're seeing so many positive things in the region. Um, the relationship, the improving relationship between Japan, the ROK, and the U.S. I mean, this trilateral relationship is where it has, it, in my view, has never been in, in the recent past. So, um, it's, you know, taking on that kind of endeavor uh, on top of what we're working through right now, I think, would be, would be very, very difficult for us. So. Thank you very much. I'll turn to, uh, uh, from Vietnam, uh, Big Chan, please. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, Secretary, you mentioned the Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness. Uh, so the program has delivered uh, radio frequency data to regional maritime agencies. So this sounds very similar to what the U.S. has already doing uh, with Sea Vision, the online platforms. So my question is that how how does AEP uh, MDA differentiate itself from existing initiative and how will it be involved to remain responsive to maritime challenges? Thank you. I, I think I missed the question here, so could you, could you just repeat the question? Uh, yes, yeah, so I would like to, to know your thought on how the Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness different from existing initiative because what it has been doing is very similar to the Sea Vision platform, then how it will involve. Yep. Thank you. There are some similarities in, uh, in current capabilities, but the idea here is that uh, we work together to increase capabilities uh, going forward, and we use that mechanism to do that. Uh, and this is not focused just on one particular uh, element of technology. Uh, this is focused eventually on a full range of uh, possibilities that uh, we can bring together. Uh, and, and the more, the merrier, quite frankly. The more that we can share this with other countries in the region, uh, the better it is for all of us. So this is, we're off to a great start. Uh, and, uh, and I think we have uh, a lot of opportunities to continue to build on this going forward. And we're going to do just that. So. Thank you very much. And we have... Uh, from the U.S. and CNN, Ivan Watson. Ivan, Thank your you. microphone is live. Yeah. Thank you, Secretary Austin. Last night, the Philippine president was asked about the ongoing sparring going on in the South China Sea between the Philippines and China and about the potential scenario of a Filipino citizen or service member being killed he said that would cross the Rubicon, it would be interpreted as an act of war, and he anticipated that treaty allies would hold that to the same standard. How would you interpret that type of scenario? Would the U.S. government interpret a death at sea as an act of war, and would that invoke a mutual defense treaty? <laughs> Let me begin by saying that our commitment to the Mutual Defense Treaty is ironclad. No questions, no exceptions, ironclad. I won't, uh, I won't speculate on any hypothetical situation. What I would say, though, is that what we are doing and what we continue to try to do is to make sure that that doesn't happen. And by increasing dialogue between, uh, you know, major powers and, and uh, making sure that countries are working together to promote uh, freedom of the seas and freedom of the skies, uh, that will narrow the possibility that this, this happens. There's, there are a number of things that can happen at sea or in the air. We recognize that. But our goal is to make sure that we don't allow things to spiral out of control unnecessarily. And again, I will not speculate on, on any one thing or another. I will continue to emphasize that our commitment to the Mutual Defense Treaty is ironclad. Thank you very much. And we have a question from uh, China, uh, Senior Colonel Yanchong Kao, please. Thank you, Host. Mr. Secretary of Defense, as we know, the United States has the largest alliance system in the world, including NATO, and is pushing for further integration of its allies in the Asia-Pacific region. My question is, is the United States planning to build a NATO-like alliance system in the Asia-Pacific region? The eastward expansion of NATO 
has led to the Ukraine crisis. What implications do you think the strengthening of the U.S. alliance system in the Asia Pacific will have on this region's security and stability? Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary. Um, I respectfully disagree with your point that the expansion of NATO uh, caused the Ukraine crisis. The Ukraine crisis was... Ukraine crisis obviously was caused because Mr. Putin made a decision to unlawfully invade his neighbor, who had an inferior military at that point in time. He assumed that he could uh, very quickly roll over uh, his neighbor and annex the country. That was two plus years ago. He has not achieved any of his strategic objectives to this point. But this was brought on because of, the, of a decision made by Mr. Putin. As to whether or not we're trying to create a NATO in the Indo-Pacific, I would tell you that what we're doing is what I said uh, earlier in the speech. Countries of like-minded countries with similar values and a, and a, a, a common vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific are working together to achieve that vision. And we've strengthened relationships with uh, our allies and partners, and we see other countries strengthen, strengthening their relationships with each other in the region. This is goodness. But it's because they have a common vision and common values. And we will continue to do those kind of things going forward. So. Thank you. And uh, from Malaysia and the Young Leaders Group, uh, Benedict Verasena. Thank you, Secretary Austin, for the uh, engaging and enlightening remarks. My question is on the point of convergence, which you brought up at, toward the end of your speech. You know, convergence is a very subjective principle indeed. So what is your view on the principle of convergence in a multipolar world with the rise of middle powers, especially in the Indo-Pacific region, which seems in contestation with the idea of convergence under a unipolar world in the past three decades? Thank you. So how, how strong is that, is that force of convergence while we see uh, middle powers rising and becoming more assertive? Thanks. Uh, I... I think that this convergence is indeed, it's very strong, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's driven not by a singular treaty, it's driven by a desire for countries, like-minded countries, to work together to ensure that we maintain the vision of an open and free Indo-Pacific and maintain a rules-based international order. And I think because of that, we'll see the momentum increase in a very positive manner. But yes, I, I do think uh, there is, there, this, is a, this is a strong uh, uh, movement, and I think, uh, again, it will occur over time. But in, in the last three years alone, all of the things that I described earlier, have occurred in three years. I would say that's momentum. And, and, and there will be other countries that, uh, that want to do other things, and that's, that's clearly understood. And, and as I said, there will be pundits and propagandists who have a different view, and, and that's fine. We welcome that. But the fact of the matter is, Countries in this region really want to protect their, their fishing rights, their exclusive uh, economic zones, uh, and they really want to prosper. And we want that 
for them as well. Their neighbors want that for them. So I, I, think, uh, I think there's strength here. Uh, things won't necessarily occur overnight in a lot of cases, but again, in the last three years, we've seen some remarkable things. So. Thank you. Uh, from France, Céline Payon, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Secretary Austin, thank you very much for your uh, opening remarks. You rightfully uh, underlined the importance of the strategic partnership. You referred to um, new and future arrangements with uh, Indo-Pacific partners and also European partners. So my question is, what are your expectations vis-à-vis uh, -vis European partners and allies in the Indo-Pacific theater? Thank you. Well, I, I don't want to embarrass them by having them raise their hand, but I would tell you that there are a number of defense ministers from Europe in the room with us today. And they're not in the room because I invited them. They're in the room because they have an interest in this region. And, you know, as I, as I engage with my counterparts in Europe, uh, I see an increasing uh, interest to to, you know, in the region and to make sure that uh, things continue to move in the right direction. Uh, even, even though, um, you know, there's a pretty significant challenge in Europe right now. Uh, but I just have to tell you that I see that interest as increasing going forward, not decreasing. So. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take a question from New Zealand. Susanna Jessup, please. Secretary Austin, thank you very much for your remarks. I wonder if you could detail efforts the US is undertaking to de-escalate tensions in your dialogue and engagement with China. Are there any areas giving you hope that regional tensions are not eventually going to spill over into kinetic conflict? Thank you. You're asking if I would detail my conversation with Minister Dong? <laughs> Is that what you have? If you don't mind. <laughs> um, a short answer is no, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the reason for that is I, I certainly, we both want to make sure that, that we maintain an open uh, dialogue here. Uh, the key piece here, the key, the key issue, is that we're talking. And as long as we're talking, we're able to identify those issues that, uh, uh, that are troublesome and that we want to make sure that, uh, that we in place guardrails to ensure, to ensure that you know, there are no misperceptions and no miscalculations and you know, incidents can spiral out of control in a region. But you can, only, you can only do that kind of thing if you are talking. And you'll recall, you, you've heard me say every year at... Uh, uh, at this dialogue, you've heard me talk about the importance of making sure that, that communicate, those communications channels are open. And I told Minister Dong that uh, if he uh, calls me in an urgent matter, I will answer the phone. And I certainly hope that he'll do the same. And it's that communication, I think, that, that will help to keep things in the right place and, and help us move things towards uh, greater stability and security in the region. But I, I know that you didn't expect for me to detail my conversation with him with anyway, but, but we, we did talk about a number of substantive issues uh, that are important to both of us. Uh, and, and again, uh, we will continue to work. We both want to make sure that uh, the channels stay open, and, and hopefully they will. We'll continue to work on these issues uh, uh, between me and him, but also with our staffs and, uh, and subordinates as well. So. Thank you very much. And we have a question from uh, the UK and the ISS. Viraj Solanki, please. Viraj. Thank you, Bastian, and thank you, Secretary Austin. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, how do you see prospects for the quad grouping of the US, Australia, Japan, and India? There's not been a leadership level summit this year due to scheduling issues and do you think the group needs to develop a more overt security focused agenda to stay relevant and how does it compare and contrast to the 
new quadrilateral grouping established the so-called squad of uh, US, Japan, Australia, and the Philippines. Thank you. So the question is, uh, as far as the quad is concerned, should, should we have more of a security focus? Um, I think there is a security focus. Uh, and of course, I engage with my counterparts in each of those countries routinely. Um, but there's an important point here. The United States military is a big hammer. And each of these countries have big hammers in their militaries. But that hammer is not the only solution to every problem, or it's not the only solution to most problems. We want to make sure that everything that we're doing, we're taking a whole of government approach, that we're using all the instruments of national power in every case to address issues, but, but also grow together in terms of the ability to share uh, capabilities and develop capabilities together. So I think this whole of government uh, uh, issue is very, very important. And quite frankly, we're hopeful that we see that uh, in more places uh, around the region as well. So, so Thank you. like 100 questions now. Well, we, we take one last one, if you don't mind. We're still in the double digits, so we're okay. okay. Um, we'll take one more from, from Indonesia, uh, Devi Fortuna Anwar, please. Thank you. Thank you, Bastian. Uh, Secretary, I really enjoyed your speech, but I noticed that you very carefully avoided mentioning China when you talk about you know, the Strait of Taiwan or about the South China Sea issues. And, and there's no mention about the U.S.-China strategic competition. So it is really a sign of, you know, uh, following from the earlier question from New Zealand, uh, of de-escalating of tension uh, between Washington and China, which of course would be very welcome to this part of the world, which is always very worried about the intensification of tension. But on the other hand, if Washington and Beijing are talking closely to each other again, while at the same time, coercive policies uh, in the South China Sea continues, how will this, you know, how will you manage this? Because we are also worried if you guys get too cozy, uh, we also get trampled. <laughs> well, um, it, it's clear that, you know, I've said this a number of times, that what we're looking for and what we have, quite frankly, in our relationship with China is a relationship based upon competition. And we're not looking for a contentious relationship. Uh, but I, I really, and to the point that you're making, we really have to be clear about uh, our expectations uh, and, uh, and the issues that we see that are very, very troubling. And if we have an open dialogue, we can address those issues in those channels. And as you would imagine, uh, Minister Dong and I had the ability to address some of those issues yesterday. I look forward to doing that going forward. We continue to work with countries in the region, like the Philippines and, and others, so many others, uh, to address their concerns to, and, and to ensure that their rights are protected and, uh, and they have access to their uh, economic zones and, and, and that sort of thing. So this is this is, a, this is a piece of work that's going to continue on, but we want a, a, a relationship that's based upon competition and not a contentious relationship. You've also heard me say a number of times that, uh, you know, war or a fight with China is neither imminent, in my view, or, or unavoidable. So, Leaders of great power nations need to continue to work together to ensure that uh, we're doing things to uh, reduce the opportunities for miscalculation and misunderstandings. And every conversation is not going to be a happy conversation. But it is important that we continue to talk to each other. And it is important that we continue to support our allies and partners uh, on their interests as well. And with that, I'll stop. 
Secretary Austin, thank you so much. What a marvelous way to kick off uh, uh, today's deliberations. Just to reassure you, there were 20 more who were seeking the floor. Um, so apologies to those uh, who we weren't able to, to get to, but there are obviously more opportunities.